a trillions will be flowing, pouring into Bitcoin market capitalization pretty soon, uh, latest, maybe February 3rd, 4th, starting where uh, Michael Saylor, MicroStrategy will be open sourcing his playbook. Thousands and thousands of businesses, corporations, boardrooms, small, mid-sized, large, huge ones will be joining. So I'm going to have a talk with Emil Sandstedt, author of uh, Money Dethroned 1 and 2. Check out his uh, Twitter uh, account and uh, buy his book, read his book. It's going to be an amazing talk. We're really looking forward to it. And let me know your questions. Please follow me on Twitter, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and my podcast platforms. Thank you so much again for your support. And let me know if you have any wishes, desires for any special guests coming up. Thank you so much. And I'll see you soon. Emil Sunset. Here. All right. Welcome to the show. Emil Sunset. back again on my show. Thank you so much for your time. Emil, how are you? Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you for inviting me again. And I'm fine. Yeah. You know, you've been on my show uh, a few times now, but uh, still, you know, there might be always new li- listeners. Do you want to like uh, sh- give a short recap, like w- your background as an author? Uh, you've, you've written some fascinating books in series like Money Dethroned. Uh, do you want to like give a brief summary of, uh, about your background, please? Sure. Um, I've been in Bitcoin uh, some years right now. And uh, the whole thing with uh, writing books, it started actually through, uh, I would say the biggest influence is uh, Saifi Amos because uh, I took his course back in the days and uh, I read uh, his book, of course, uh, The Bitcoin Standard. And it kind of threw me into this path of Austrian economics and uh, how money emerged and how money did not emerge, all this. So it piqued my interest and I started to uh, write articles, articles about this that that uh, dealt with a little bit the same as Sefdin talks about, these uh, glass beads and the seashells, etc. You know, that kind of stuff. I published a lot of articles called uh, Tales of Soft Money, detailing how money is actually something that can be destroyed and that can be dethroned. Um, so after a while, I felt like I had so many articles that I could actually compile a book on the subject. Yeah, here you go. There's some uh, different kind of articles uh, that uh, describes how various monies basically are replaced by better monies and that this is a market process. So in any way, um, I, I wrote the first book. It's called Money Dethroned, a historical journey. Here it is. And uh, it deals with the primitive monies and uh, metallic monies. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of the prehistory of, of money, if you will. So it explains why we could go from hundreds of difference of uh, primitive monies to essentially gold and silver and in a sense copper. So you have this Mengarian effect that you go from many to one. This is, uh, um, uh, as far as I know, it's only the Austrian school that talks about this effect because all other schools are basically saying that the state needs to be involved with money. Um, whereas the Austrian school quickly just states that uh, if you let the market do its thing, money will converge towards one medium because it's more efficient to have one money than for the world to operate on 200 monies. So it's just cost considerations by individuals uh, that forces uh, forces all these uh, monies to uh, to converge into one. So in an, in a, any way, this is the dynamic that I explain in this uh, first book, Money the Throne, A Historical Journey. I try to make it uh, a bit more fun for the reader. So in order not to just write dry recounts of, uh, of history, uh, it follows in the footstep of uh, an actual traveler, uh, Ibn Matuta, who traveled all over the world. And he, uh, in his writing, he has observed a lot of these things, the different monies that he used to, to buy food uh, in Africa, uh, to buy stuff in India and in China, etc. Um, and so to pivot to the second book, then it kind of deals with the same uh, concept that it follows in the footsteps of uh, a British spy and explorer, Sir uh, Richard Burton. And he is also traveling all these places in the world. And he's not interested in money at all, but he still makes a lot of detailed uh, uh, notes about monies because he stumbles upon them. He's using glass beads in Africa in the 19th century, for example. He sees uh, the various currency implosions in Brazil, for example, where the paper currency is worth less than uh, you know the assignat in France. So I draw from his travels also, and I build the same story in the second book, which is called also Money Dethroned, 
a journey through ashes and uh, i don't have the physical copy with me now it's ordered i guess it will come soon um it is a sequel but it can be read as a standalone and in my in my eyes it's more relevant than the first one so i really encourage the readers to check it out here it is uh, for anyone who's watching this it's uh, over 200 pages and uh, it deals not with the primitive stuff that the first book is dealing with this is about money failures so more recent examples and it's more relevant for us today so essentially this is 13 chapters on uh, currencies all over the world on all continents in many nations many different centuries no matter if it's summer spring autumn or, or winter you know money can implode because it follows monetary laws it follows economic laws it doesn't care which country you live in and it's kind of the point with this book that I <clears throat> I proved that the many um, with the many money failures of the 18th and 19th centuries, I proved that uh, if you think it around with inconvertible paper, essentially what we have today in the world, it's very dangerous. Um, so it's in a sense a warning. It's uh, I don't want to be an alarmist, but it, it is uh, my warning that I really enjoyed writing also because it draws from all these separate occasions that all prove that how easy it is to wreck the economy if you wreck the money. And uh, so, so everyone understands that, for example, hyperinflation wrecks the economy, right? Um, but let's, let's think about a little bit how, how does the overissuing of money or currency, how does that affect the economy? Well, when, uh, when people trade with each other in a modern society, I mean, we are not hunter gatherers. We are not just 30 people who, who can divide labor. You know, you go and hunt your food. I will go and gather my mushrooms and whatever. Uh, that's that you could work, work it out without money if it is that small. But if you want scale, if you have a large society, if you have cities, you need money because without money, you cannot trade. You have the problem of this, uh, the coincidence of wants, the problem of direct barter. So money is used to circumvent this problem. As we all know and uh, that's why when you start to tinker away or when you over issue the money uh, or the currency it means that you are hammering away at the very keystone of this bridge and this bridge is what it's what takes the producer of food the producers of cars the producers of shoes and whatever to the consumers it's the only way they can communicate on scale <clears throat> so when you hammer away at the keystone of this bridge that is money uh, and the money it just and the money collapses that means you can imagine if the bridge collapses there's no way to get over the, the river then and uh, that's really really dangerous I, I prove it in my book what happens when you wreck the money trade cannot operate that means that uh, for millions of people living in the cities how can they start to grow food quickly it's not possible uh, they need to have money so yeah, so in order not to rant too long, well, the second book is uh, is a warning um, how easy it is to wreck paper currencies, inconvertible paper currencies, I might add. And this is the system that we have today. So when the Federal Reserve and the central banks are now expanding their balance sheets, that's their way of hammering away at the keystone that I talk about. They increase, they leverage the risk on the whole monetary system. The more this... Uh, this uh, balance sheets are in increased, the more systemic risk you will have of, you know, money failures in the future. Um, so I thought it was a timely, 2020 was a, a timely period for me to write this book and I, I got it out just before the new year. Let's hope the warning doesn't come to fruition, but it seems like these, these guys, they don't really know what they're doing. So they're continuing to expanding the balance sheets right now. They continue to increase the the, the, the money supply in the system and they think that it's good but it it can't be good uh, Emil let us a little let us discuss a little bit in light of the current events that are going ongoing with the you know with the whole manipulation of the what do you call it the stock market um, um, with Robin Hood and um, the shorts naked short selling uh, do you have like do you want to give my listeners like uh, a 
some kind of background story and tie it in with with this broken money we have this this uh, you know fiat money that uh, where people are actually forced to you know to go into these kind of uh, you know waste a lot of time and energy going into the stock market and and trying to you know um, uh, speculate on on things and then you have you know this totally two tiered system you know you have the uh, legacy system and you have the retail uh, retail traders we who have the retail traders have no chance against the legacy system because it's all rigged right um would it be you know the rehypothecation of assets of securities um what's your opinion on that how can you tie this into the money well, I have followed what's, what has happened with GameStop a little bit, uh, not not in depth because it takes too much time. It's very entertaining and uh, I think it's despicable that they were not allowed to sell their shares that they bought because when you buy a share at Robinhood, for example, I mean, it's in the contract that you, you must be able to sell it later, right? So I, I think this violated contract law, basically. It's not the, the free market doing its thing. You know, when Twitter... When Twitter kicks up some persons, I don't really care because it's it's not like your property rights were violated, in my opinion. But when you cannot sell the property that you bought on this platform, that's an, that's a different story, and a lot of people lose a lot of money. So this this is a mess. I hope that they bring uh, litigation and uh, you know go after these guys because it's it's such a blatant conflict of interest. The owners of Robinhood are owned themselves by uh, some of these uh, players that lost a lot of money when the shares went up or that would have lost a lot of money. So it's, it's, that's very bad. And to connect it to the money, you say, well, this is um, one connection is this is all centralized. They, they could stop the trading because they, they felt like they had to. And, uh, uh, centralized uh, custodians in this manner, they are security holes. I mean, um, you can lose a lot by trusting them too much, which many people have, have done now. Um, I don't know any way around it. People talk about DeFi, etc., but you know, that's, that has its own problems. You can have your DeFi contracts explode because of some bugs and, and you lose a lot more. Um, so there's, I don't know any way around it. Um, but the problem is the problem is centralization and uh, that the state has so much power that, you know, I don't know what happened in this case with the uh, GameStop, but if the state or any of its uh, underdogs were somehow involved, the SEC, for example, to kind of to uh, cut the losses for these hedge funds because they didn't want uh, the hedge funds to blow up and cause ripple effects. No, that's bad. Um, it impedes on the free market again. When the when the SEC and and, and the state uh, interferes, so 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 to summarize, I, I'm on the I'm on the side of the redditors in this case. Yeah, I think I mean the way I I would explain is that it started off with uh, was it Melvin Melvin Capital or Melvin Institution that uh, sort of um, tried to short the GameStop stocks, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So they bought so they sold more shares than there were outstanding existing. And then there mm -hmm. were, uh, you know, a, a bunch of uh, what, what, what I don't know what they call them themselves, Wall Street betters or something like that on Reddit, that um, that one of these guys um, on Reddit he had found out a long time ago that 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 the, that uh, he found out he researched which which stocks were most shorted, mm -hmm. and, it, and it seemed like one of those was Game GameStop. So what they did is like they they got together and bought like more and more of, of the stocks. And um, while uh, the other institution, the legacy found it, which, which I think it was the same, same entity, the same characters that were actually um, in 2008 uh, were, were bailed out, right. With billions and actually, you know, in totality with all the institutions in, in, in trillions. And uh, I'm just, I'm just trying to, you know, give a recap maybe to, to, to our listeners. Like, this is the consequence, I think. This is the, the, these are the second, third order effects when you have a broken money. I think this is the message I'm trying to, to convey. Is that correct? 
I think you are correct in, in a sense because if the money is easily produced, it's much, much more easy to embark on these bailouts. Um, let's go back to 2008. If if the state or if the if rather the, the financial system, those entrenched in the financial system wanted more money or more liquidity for various reasons, they could get it through the, the central bank or through uh, through orders from above, essentially. And um, this is something, um, it, it's very bad because it, it introduces all of this, uh, this moral hazard that, okay, yeah, they bail us out, let's take more risk next time because we, are, <clears throat> we might be even bigger or we are probably already bigger than 2009. Everything has grown. Um, there is more depth out there right now. So you just build moral hazard on moral hazard. Um, and people think very short term, politicians think short term because they want to be reelected. So the only solution is to have a money that the, the state can't mass produce. Um, then they, I mean, I'm against the tax also, but then they have to actually gather taxes first and they have to use these spares, the spares resources to really choose, okay, this, this company is very important for us. Let's bail it out and let's let these other nine fail. Now they can bail out all the 10, just take on more debt because uh, um, the currency is issued against debt. You can just uh, increase the, the asset and the liability side of the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. So it's uh, all short term thinking. It's, um, I mean, we, it's, it's a very fragile system, mm. it looks to me. Let me let me read because uh, you know Marty Bent um, gives uh, you know sends out a newsletter every day, but this one was a short one. Um, he says uh, it starts off it's pretty funny. It says George Carlin, you know the comedian who mm -hmm. died I think many years ago, is super funny. The guy George Carlin was so goddamn prescient. After today, if it isn't abundantly clear to you that we live in a too tired two-tiered society I described yesterday, there may be no hope for you. The abrupt halting of the ability of retail investors to buy GME, AMC, NOK on Robinhood and a few other trading platforms was nothing short of criminal. The only option users had on Robinhood was to hold or mm -hmm. sell. There were even reports of Robinhood for selling on behalf of users for their own safety making it so the price could only go in one direction, down. In favor of Melvin Capital, Citadel, by the way, Citadel uh, did a lot of millions of contribution to the Biden administration, uh, we just found out. In favor of Melvin Capital, Citadel, and others who were caught with their pants down. Again, this was criminal, and everyone involved should be tried for manipulation. These actions are also leading me to believe that my hunch that the Tende army was pulling forward a systemic collapse is a good hunch. Today is a pivotal day for a modern civilization. I won't be surprised if this is pinpointed as an inflection point that leads to mass exodus away from the kleptocratic elite. The energy flowing through social media today was palpable. The people are absolutely pissed and seem primed to do something about it. So, you know, I'm just saying um, the, the reason I'm reading this is that I think uh, thanks, you know, to the internet and to this, to the social media with all the censorship still going on, you know, even on Twitter and whatever. And I mean, uh, there were just hundred thousand negative comments removed by mm. Apple and Google from Robinhood because they were downgraded to, to, to like one or something, right? Uh, it's unbelievable, right? Uh, and these are just, you know, second, third, and maybe even fourth order effects and consequences which you can see, but because of this, you know, chain reaction of communication and, and, and people finally waking up and, you know, interconnecting with one another and understanding more and more the bigger picture, also thanks to you, you know, so this is why I want to go a little bit into this rabbit hole, like what, these are just symptoms we're seeing, we're witnessing, but it always goes to the root and that is money, you know, because it's not, you know, finally we have Bitcoin, you know, now maybe you want to talk about Bitcoin, um, you know, wh wh what can we do with Bitcoin? Can we, you know, finally make the controlling structures uh, which have been, you know, in control of the issuance of money, of the manipulation of money, of the inflation and hyperinflation of the debasement of money, responsible, obsolete? Well, I will tell you, what I think about how Bitcoin affects the current system. And it, it does affect it in a positive way because states have monopoly in money, kind of a monopoly. Um, it's still legal in most countries to, to own Bitcoin, etc. They haven't 
caught up with it yet or they have decided not to to ban it but bitcoin keeps their their bad fiat currencies in check because they can't really play around with for example the dollar too much because everyone is in a free market in the american market people can view the the balance sheet of the federal reserve and they can assess the credit risk this credit risk on the balance sheet it's tied to the value of the dollar so if they play around too much and they buy them they buy too many uh young bonds i mean the credit risk gets just too high and people will not want to hold these dollars they, they try to get rid of them for other assets and that's what causes inflation um the price of the dollar declines that's the same as uh, prices of everything else goes up so if there is this alternative that is hard to stop which bitcoin is that means that the money managers that don't know anything about economics they need to at least try to keep a semblance of integrity of their fiat currencies or they will see an escape from it you can't have a mass exodus right now because bitcoin is simply not ready for it um, this might change in the future if if it can scale uh, in a decentralized way through the lightning network we have talked a little bit about this uh, so it's a, just a gradual process and for every day that passes these uh, more and more people can actually join the bitcoin network um, so bitcoin is already now affecting what they are doing with the money but that doesn't mean that they they are smart enough to realize that they have to actually care about the quality of, of the currency they might um, it might implode anyway and then we are in deep trouble because bitcoin can't you know yet uh, so i hope that they uh, i hope that they <clears throat> you know take it easy but it doesn't look like they they're doing it they are doing this quantitative easing it's a it's kind of an orwellian term because it doesn't make it easier for anyone if you pre if you issue more currency it just leads to more hardships down the line you, you push the problem forward so it, it, nothing gets easier when they issue any new currency. A fixed, fixed uh, quantity currency is the best currency. That's that's just how it works. Anything else is a fa is a fallacy, and it's a fallacy that uh, ninety seven percent of the world um, actually believes. <clears throat> so yeah, the, <clears throat> that's one way to tie how Bitcoin is operating <clears throat> right now to what is happening with the, the the financial system. So did you have anything else in mind? Um, okay, let's 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 suppose um, you know it will this development with the lightning and mm. the transition to a you know to a hard money uh, will become facilitated much easier you know on every level you know not only as a store of value but as a settlement layer as a medium of exchange you know with all the development mm. going on lightning Jack Muller's um, uh, what do you call it strike right. um, and and every other you know. Um, um, infrastructure that can be built within and, and surrounding Bitcoin. Let's let's just say it, it really you know will be accomplished within the next few years. How do you how do you see then you know the 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 second third order effects ongoing? How, what can be achieved? What 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 what's the benefit to to society to to the individual out there to the sovereignty? <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> that would be a great benefit. There, there are a number of things that that if if they implode their own currencies, which some nations will do, and they, they have already done it in Venezuela and other nations, people often forget these small nations because they are unimportant, their industries are destroyed, uh, they are, you know, so, someone else's problem. People think that these things cannot happen to themselves, but it can. You are, we are not different from Venezuelans, we are humans, and uh, it can affect your country also, and it has, it's, it has affected all of our developed nations in Europe, in the US. US has had uh, hyperinflation. Europe has had so many instances of hyperinflation. Um, so yeah, um, I think that uh, if, if the scaling continues uh, on its road and also we scale through certain central, this is a bit uh, controversial maybe, but if we scale also through certain centralized custodians, we know, we know what happened with gold, that it got co-opted. So we can't put too much in the centralized solutions. Then we will be screwed. But if uh, if you put you know pocket money in it, essentially, uh, the things that you want to use for very, very low transaction fees, that helps to scale Bitcoin in a way. And then we keep 
you know, the large, or we, I shouldn't speak for others, but if I would keep my own Bitcoin, uh, I would keep the majority on, uh, on a decentralized solution, of course. <clears throat> um, that would mean, uh, I mean, more wealth for everyone. That would facilitate better, um, better uh, financial organization. Um, as I said, if they if they mess with the money, that that leads to some really bad things, and all the different contracts in the economy are thrown into disorder. Creditors are ruined. Debtors, you know, they can uh, celebrate. They have all these externalities that are really really bad. It becomes unprofitable to invest in the, in the factories etc because you do not know what purchasing power you will uh, your customers will have in the future so whatever bitcoin can do to um, to facilitate you know hard money behind the, behind the the white legal system um, <clears throat> that's good for everyone it might be bad for the state but it's it's good for us as individuals who want to trade our labor with each other that we have something to choose from. Now, you've you probably heard and, and you know seen that the Michael Sale of MicroStrategy is, uh, is going to start on February third and fourth uh, of open sourcing his playbook. And allegedly, there are thousands of businesses, uh, corporate boardrooms, uh, even Walt Disney. I heard <clears> you know. We don't know. We don't know the full list, but um, it seems that starting in February third. It's actually my birthday. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, he, they're they're gonna he's gonna open source his playbook. So, do you see like a huge uh, flow pouring of you know billions or maybe even trillions of of institutional money into Bitcoin, into as a reserve asset? Well, probably, and uh, you know that's how I use Bitcoin. Also, I use it as a reserve asset that's easy to move between borders, etc. So then it's not really money yet. Uh, money that's what I buy use when I buy food, electricity, etc. You know, everyday purchases. So Bitcoin can be used not only as money, but it can be used as this uh, this thing that can't be taken from you. Gold historically was both money and the reserve asset. Bitcoin right now is a, is a, a budding uh, reserve asset, I would say, and it works very well for it. So yeah, these companies I haven't thought much about it, but I, I guess uh, they, I guess it's in their interest also not, of course, not to own a lot of government bonds. And uh, if they need something, you know, I don't know, it, it's tricky because if they have also, if they make profit and, uh, and the pile of wealth in the companies grow, it's always an option to, to do a dividend and let the individual owners of the company do what they want with the money right some might want to buy bitcoin so it's a bit tricky some some owners of the share might not want the uh, the board to speculate on various assets but uh, it's up to the company i mean it's it's their uh, resources so they can do what they want with it i for sure think that more companies will continue to buy bitcoins we have seen what's what's going on right now it's obvious yeah. it's going to continue and it's showing, you know, especially if you look at the EU, it's, um, I think there's a catastrophic coming and there's, you know, um, other experts like, you know, uh, Markus Pollack, um, no, I'm sorry, what's his name? Markus Kral, Dr. Markus Kral, Dr. Torsten Pollack, mm -hmm. they're both Austrian economists and very, I mean, they're gold bugs more or less, but, but uh, their analysis is very, you know, very sharp, you know, in Germany alone, in Germany alone, there are approximately 800,000 zombified companies. So mm. they're going to infect other healthy co companies, it's, it's especially, you know, it's in, in light of all the lockdown and, and the whole political things that's going on in the background. So, uh, and then you have the central bank, the ECB, uh, you know, similar to, to the Fed or any other central bank printing or, you know, creating money out of thin air. So the debt spiral will get worse and worse. And, I think the people are finally waking up. The reason I'm asking you is because once institutions coming in, I think the, the connection change... is a little bit uh, bad now, Kevin. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, can you hear me now? Is it better? Can you can you hear me? Is it better now? Yeah, I, I hear you now, I, I, and I think I, I I can hear you now. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah. 
Sorry, yeah, I have to edit it. Okay. Okay. Now let's uh, let's continue with what you were talking about these zombie companies because I think this is very important. That's what happens when you artificially lowers the interest rate because the, the interest rate it represents the cost of capital that uh, you borrow to to expand your business. You hire <clears throat> workers. You you hire. Uh, uh, you rent all its machines, you build the factory, etc. So when you manipulate the interest rate and you lower the interest rate, all the companies in the economy, healthy companies in a free market economy, they think that suddenly there is uh, uh, an abundance of capital. So um, they, they embark on all these expansionary projects. And of course, there isn't an, aband uh, an abundance of capital. There is not magically more machines out there on the street just because they lowered interest rate. So what they find find out in the middle of the expansion, when it uh, half the new hotel or half the new factory, they realize that uh, the, the costs are increasing. We need to pay more because we cannot all compete for the same labor. We cannot all compete for the same uh, uh, machines. Um, so a low interest rate hides the fact that there is just a, a finite uh, number of machines and the uh, workers and, and uh, you know everything so it, it distorts the price of capital of uh, of real uh, things in the economy so what happens is that some of these uh, companies that embarked on expansion they need to abandon the products because uh, there simply is not you cannot import aliens to work for you there is there is only a fixed number of people that can work for you for example so they abandon them and that's why you see in certain I think Spain is a good example. I might have mentioned this for you earlier, but um, when they joined the euro, the interest rate fell there, and you had this building boom that everyone wanted to start to build uh, hotels and, and uh, you know, real estate. So when you took the car around Spain for 10 years ago, you could see all of these projects that were just ghost towns. They, yes, they started. They still are, right? I mean, they still are. I mean, I think so. I, I, haven't, just empty. I, I haven't taken the car there uh, um, but when I was there like 10 years ago, it was like this. You could see them. Uh, and that's an example of capital destruction because you have all these machines have built these things and you have people who have worked on these projects and they have to abandon them in the middle of everything. That's destroying capital. Um, <clears throat> that's why zombie companies, zombie companies are just um, a proxy for, it shows how much capital is destroyed all the time. And what happens... Um, what happens when you destroy capital? Well, capital is the capital is what separates. I like this expression. It, it's what separates the age of the cave from the age of the skyscraper. We are in the age of the skyscraper. There's only one thing that separates today from how people lived uh, twenty thousand years ago. They had no capital. We have accumulated capital for thousands and thousands of years. These are the machines and and factories and everything. So you don't want this accumulated stock of capital to start deteriorate. So, but that's what happened. That, that's what they're doing. The capital is deteriorating. I mean, it's always deteriorating, even in a market economy. But it's repaired and grow. So in a market economy, the total stock of capital always increases because that's how people like to make a profit. When you just distort the interest rate, uh, the price of capital, you end up in some periods you destroy more of it than what is built. So it's a net, uh, it's a net destruction of capital. And that's, <clears throat> that's probably what's going on right now when you have all these zombie companies, because people are working on these zombie companies. They are, they're wasting capital. They're working there. They have, uh, probably factories. Some of these zombie companies, they have machines, etc. They are utilizing capital that is not profitable, but, the, but, but the, the central planners have made it profitable because they pushed the interest rate so low. So I, I hope the, the listeners understand this dynamic. Yeah, yeah. And you know what the real problem is? I mean, especially in Germany, is that with all these zombified companies, um, as I've listened you know, to some <clears throat> other German-speaking uh, experts, they're saying that uh, they're actually being instigated or, or you know, they're being told not to, not to go into insolvency, even though they are insolvent. <clears throat> so this is actually criminal <laughs> because if you're insolvent, you need to go into insolvency right yeah these people that work on these companies they can work on the on the thriving companies instead but they are since the state kind of 
puts them in these zombie companies. They're stuck there, and there's a there's a, a lack of resources then, and lack of people to work on actually good companies. This is how you destroy capital. You know, it's a fit in the most yeah. calls Bitcoin, the number go up technology. I know um, it's a slightly different point now, but just wanted to go back to Bitcoin again, is that um, the reason I ask about the institutional money pouring in into Bitcoin, and, and that's going to be, I think, a so, sort of a slowly but <clears throat> suddenly, a gradual and suddenly, you know, according to Parker Lewis <laughs> terminus um, thing. Um, do you think it will it will cause a chain reaction in 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 the you know mass adoption like like retailers like uh, you know individuals because you know once the number goes up and the market capitalization of bitcoin goes to easily you know 1 trillion 2 trillion do you think then it will be i mean it's already mainstream bitcoin is already mainstream but do you think that it will somehow um, you know steer up something like a, ch a chain reaction I don't know about chain reaction because that implies that it's very easy to onboard. And I know that this is a bit unpopular, but it is it is hard to uh, deal with Bitcoin as a retailer now, for example, if you're not tech savvy and you have your channels, lightning channels, for example, and you, I mean, it's hard because if it were easy, it would already be widespread. You would have people out in the economy accepting BTC uh, because uh, they realize that it's, it's something that is not diluted and uh, there's low costs on using it as a medium of exchange. But there is yet not, not much of this. Um, when the lightning implementations get better and better, you will see more and more adoption. But I think to realize that this is hard, it's, um, Bitcoin is more than 10 years old and it has, the protocol hasn't changed massively during this time. And yet, after all these years, <clears throat> there's still struggling. We are still struggling with uh, scaling in a decentralized manner. So it's a very tough work and it's hard. And of course, I, I think some people will absolutely be uh, successful in uh, implementing it profitably. But right now it's uh, it's difficult or we would have seen the market embrace it more quickly. So I, I see I see kind of a slow expansion ahead for Bitcoin uh, as a reserve asset and then more and more slowly as a way to, to use this money. Yeah, but that's what I meant. I mean, that more and more people just, you know, um, decide to accumulate Bitcoin as a store of value, just, you know, as a saving yeah, this, technology. I think this will uh, continue. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, there will be, you know, there will be critical mass by, you know, in the next few years. And, um, but it could be, you know, it could happen much faster because of the institutional money, you know, pouring in. And now it's becoming sort of a, you know, socially acceptable <laughs> for Bitcoin, you know? Definitely. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's a different feeling right now. After it recovered from the from the 2017 crash there um, and just blew the the old all time high i mean it's done it so many times now and people start to actually understand a little bit more they don't they don't accept the theories um that they have been told you know this shallow theories to why bitcoin can't work more and more people are realizing that it's just it's just lies everyone's saying that bitcoin can't work and yet it's it's working all the time exactly yeah um, nothing changed so I think it, it we will con we will have a continual you know ex adoption in this matter as a reserve asset. There are more and more there's more and more currency or money entering the system, and that's always also you know flowing towards Bitcoin. And I think one good example would be the negative yield on uh, on bonds because mm -hmm. people pay to have their uh, well they pay to park their money somewhere uh, and not even good money. If you're a creditor in this world, you can get screwed over even without negative interest rates. So uh, a lot of this has to do with regulations that some, you know, the pension funds, etc. they have to have these bonds. And if you have to have something, you push up the price. And when the bond price goes up, that's the same as the yield going down. But still, um, as soon as long as there is such a low interest rates, it's much better um, economically to just shift to Bitcoin. Uh, so I think it's a one, it's one good indicator. As long as you have all these uh, low interest rates, Bitcoin just, can just continue to grow. When you don't have it anymore, when you actually get yield on your, on your lending, then people will start to think more about, yeah, but I can lend my, my money instead of putting it, it into Bitcoin and actually get a real yield. So, but we don't have this yield now, it's negative. 
Yeah. And um, I think it was Preston Pish who started off with the $100 trillion mar bond market. Uh, um, you know, being like, uh, like being on the risk that it could implode. Uh, we have a $100 trillion bond market. Do you think a, a lot of it, a lot of that money will pour into Bitcoin once, you know, once the cat is out of the bag? I, I don't know, but this is uh, this giant pile of bad bonds it's very dangerous because these bonds they are on the as they are on the asset side of the central banks and what does this mean that means that so w when currency is issued um, the currency goes out in the into the financial system and the, the the federal reserve for example acquires a bond for for as a payment so assets and liabilities increases equally so on the asset side they have a lot of bonds and the, the reason this is important is when the, when the dollar enters the economic system, the financial system, it has to have a way back to the Federal Reserve to be burned again. Otherwise, you have inflation, runaway inflation. And this is the system today that it has a way back through the bonds. The, the money is entering uh, the system through debt and the debt is repaid and the money comes back and everyone is happy, you know, uh, and the state has done a little sinner's profit uh, in the equation. But then in any case, when you have large scale implosions of bond markets, that's that they're defaulting on the bonds. That means that there is no way for the money to get back. Then you have hyperinflation and that's extremely dangerous. So I, I really hope it doesn't happen. Um, I, I would much, much prefer a controlled uh, collapse of, of their over borrowing and over consumption. But, you know, politicians, they, they like to promise a lot of things for their, for the voters. It's easier to spend money that you don't have. Uh, if it's not, um, if it doesn't have much repercussions on you, um, so it's kind of a bug in in the democratic system that you get votes if you promise people stuff that uh, you have not, you know, obtained. If you can just print, if you can just issue money, so we'll see what happens. I, I really hope for a, a good solution in all this because, yeah, I've already. I will not scare, scare the listeners more. It, it can be very bad. So Bitcoin but, is but, uh, transition. I think I th <laughs> it's transition, and I still think we will see this continual siphoning from these other kind of overvalued assets to Bitcoin. Um, and I actually think we'll see continual siphoning to uh, to gold also, gold and Bitcoin, um, because people do not want to put everything. They have different risk characteristics. Uh, Bitcoin has some better things than gold and gold has some things that Bitcoin doesn't have, but people don't want to put everything. I mean, who want to own, who wants to own uh, uh, bonds right now? It's, right, it's insane. Right. Well, the thing bonds is, are at all -time the, high yeah, and... it depends on the degree of comprehension. I think once you understand Bitcoin and there's people, you know, who oh, there are more and more people saying that, you know, what, what do I need gold for? Because once, you know, once there's a, uh, once you can somehow, you know, break up this the manipulation of the gold price, and and you and there's a and there's a you know a strengthening in demand. You you can if you want to you know create more gold if you want. I mean, it's just it's just dependent mm -hmm. on the time, resources, energy, and the technological innovation you put into gold. And this is something, yeah. right? I mean, paper gold cannot protect people against what may happen. You know, when when you have this uh, implosion of debt, for example. There's not a chance in hell that the, the states will let paper gold be. They will try to obtain wealth from there through either taxation or direct confiscations of, of various kinds. So it's about having an asset that can't be confiscated. Um, and that's that's where Bitcoin excels. It's really hard to confiscate. So so paper gold is not an uh, answer to uh, to what's going on today in the world. It would be uh, physical gold. Physical I don't gold. have any physical, but but yeah. for those who i understand if people were going for the physical but to go to the paper gold and think that you're safe from the looters that's not how it works exactly yeah i mean they're just uh it's just over leveraged uh, paper gold versus physical gold but i but i mean, really meant you know the 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 discovery or what you call it, the mining of, of physical gold <clears throat> i think that can be if you know if if the if the necessary time energy and technological innovation and resources are put into the mining of gold, into the discovery of gold, they can find more physical gold. 
And that's that's I think the tricky part about gold, which we haven't seen yet. I think it it it's possible, and uh, and um, and and versus you know the the because always you know always about the relative scarcity of gold versus of the absolute scarcity of Bitcoin. And I think the absolute scarcity is just you know is always uh, by order of magnitude more valuable in the long term. I think it's it's hard to find more gold, but I mean, there's not a zero probability of uh, it. It can happen that some that we can find gold easier. Right now, it has been uh, added production under two percent per year for I think fifty years, but of course that can change <clears throat> with Bitcoin. It is rather about uh, software bugs, which luckily enough for Bitcoin, they're hard to uh, find out about because we we can ver verify the supply. So we have had supply issues. Uh, we, we have had supply bugs in Bitcoin before, where you know they're created from from thin air, and then then it's patched very quickly. So these kind of things can happen to Bitcoin. But I think the I mean the total risk of of having the supply increase in Bitcoin more than gold is much much lower, as you say, um, because it we don't know what kind of bugs are out there uh, and how easy it is to spot everything. With these privacy protocols like Zcash and the Monero, there it's much harder to uh, to notice when someone has found a bug and they start to create coins from thin air. Yeah. It's really hard. I think it was uh, in but the with Bitcoin, the it's bugs easy. have already been fixed, don't you think so? In Bitcoin, I mean, maybe it was in the beginning they could have somehow, you know, uh, uh, dis somehow destroyed destroyed Bitcoin in the beginning. But now, after twelve years, uh, it's it's already set in stone. I mean, it's the, the fundamental property, I mean, of Bitcoin, the, the absolute scarcity with whatever the last Bitcoin to be mined in 2140 and with all the other monetary and technological properties, it's set in stone. So, um, and then you've got, you know, the, the stock to flow I ratio think... that's going to take over gold. And right now it's what, between 55 and 60 in, with gold and and Bitcoin mm -hmm. will, will exceed the stock to flow ratio, I think, in at, at, yeah. by next half. Up, up to 100 or something. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's correct. No, I, I'm not worried at all about uh, dilution in supply for Bitcoin. I run my own full node, so no one can force me to change the code. And my code is 21 million. That's nice. what, what I'm going to run. It's in my self-interest to not inflate the supply. So um, go, gold has a bigger problem in this regard. Yeah. And we do, we really don't know how much gold there is. I mean, there's always these statistics of 200,000 tons or 190,000 tons of gold existing stock and the, and the flow of gold yearly between 2% two, 2 or 1.8%, 2%, 2.5%. But we really don't even know like how much gold there is deposited at the central banks, how much gold there is really. I mean, this is the intransparency versus the full transparency of, of Bitcoin that's, that's always going to shine out, right? Or shine through mm. okay emil any other uh perspectives you have before we wrap up well it, since we're wrapping up i can tell uh tell the readers that get my book on amazon it's an it's an ebook so uh, kindle or uh, paperback it's 200 pages it's a very interesting read in my opinion because it draws a lot from uh, eyewitness accounts on these money failures and you will see that for hundreds of years ago the people living back then, they observed the same things that the same idiotic notions that you will observe today. Uh, when the politicians promise that the issues will not be a problem in the future, that they need to do it to have any, you know, to get the economy going again, etc., etc. It's the same stuff, and they really just they imploded their economies with the tyranny and uh, authoritarianism as a result. So, so get it. It's not. It's not only. Um, it's not uh, just to scare people. It's very interesting in a, from a historical perspective to read these uh, guys, what they were thinking back then. Yeah, and I also like but, that you package it in a, you know, as a story because I think you, you can reach much more, m many more people uh, by, by you know, formulating it through a, through a storyteller or through a story on, on or whatever you call it, you know, uh, like a novel or something. So I think people, instead of, you know, very dry historical uh, facts, mm -hmm. But uh, I think it, it can open up the minds and the hearts of, of people much, you know, in a much more easy way. Yeah, I agree. And, and if I could, you know, pick one, uh, one observation from the book that 
kind of that I want to you to that I want to, to stick with you. It's that uh, after the Continentals in the U.S. imploded, uh, you know, they had a, the revolution in 1776. There were important writers there that compared the implosion of the Continentals to what massacres the English had conducted on the continent, and they came to the conclusion that more men had, more people had perished from the money implosion than from the artillery and muskets from the enemy. So these are really serious matters. You better uh, not uh, screw around with the money too much. Um, that's that's what I hope more more and more people realize that it's not a toy. Yeah, and I hope this is the really the inflection point of you know, 2021, where where we really learn out of history, because it I see it seems like people haven't really, you know, we as human civilization as society haven't really learned from history a lot. So things are repeating, the no. indoctrination going on and conditioning. So, but but the, there maybe I don't know maybe the pain point is now different. Uh, I really don't know, but. Um, so yeah, any other places people can follow you? Well, you can follow me on Twitter uh, at Besant Denier or just uh, search for yeah. Besant. I uh, I have a Medium page also, so you can uh, you can find me there. Search for Emil Sandstedt. and also my my web page uh, bdratings.org has all my old articles for free, and uh, there's a lot of sources there also to free books that are uploaded on archive.org that so you can read all these uh, historical accounts for free if that's your if that's your thing okay emil thank you so much for your time and for your contribution you your people really uh, are uh, i think are they are hungry for for knowledge for the first time when it comes to money now and i think we are we're getting it i think we're we're, we're finally you know at the, at the root at the root of of all the symptoms now and we're, we're finally getting it. Maybe it's because also of the interconnectedness. So thank you so much for your contributions and your, your educational work in the background. Thank you, Kevin. And I would love to be back on your show anytime. Yes, yeah, awesome. yeah, let's do a panel discussion in the very near future. Okay, Emil, take care and have a good day. Okay, bye. Bye. Hey, hope you love this talk with Emil Sunset as much as I did. Really was amazed at his uh, you know, depth of his knowledge. So, you know, uh, it's going all to the root cause, uh, to the core of all the symptoms and all the second order, third, whatever effects. So, you know, uh, mass adoption is coming sooner or later. It's uh, the trillions are pouring into Bitcoin and, uh, you know, Bitcoin fixes this. And that's why we have all these, you know, manipulation, fraud, criminality going on by order of magnitude. So let me know what you think. Let me know your questions. Please follow me and Emil sunstead on twitter please subscribe to youtube channel and podcast button leave a five-star review on itunes or apple podcasts that helps a lot of the algorithm so that the educational materials is distributed uh more and more and let me know your questions if you have any and uh yeah hope hope you loved it and i'll see you soon again bye